Hey everybody, Brett Etheridge here, founder of Dominate the GRE, welcome. And in this video, I have something special for you. So earlier this week, I was invited to do a webinar for the Ross uh, University School of Veterinary Medicine, specifically with GRE verbal strategies for ESL students, for students for whom English is not their native language. They get a lot of applicants from Puerto Rico, other Latin countries and South American countries. They're located on the island of St. Kitts, which what a beautiful place to go to school, right? So if you're considering vet school, definitely check out Ross University. But uh, anyway, I, I delivered that webinar, it was well received. And when I got done, I just kind of thought to myself, you know what, a lot of these strategies, especially around reading comprehension, are relevant for everybody taking the GRE, looking to improve their reading comprehension, not just people for whom English isn't their first language. And so I decided to bring it to you and let you in on kind of that portion of the webinar where I share three strategies to help you improve your reading comprehension, kind of very tangible, actionable things that you can do to get more right answers, and just overall how to read passages effectively, how to improve your reading comprehension in general. So that's what I'm gonna let you in on. I think you're going to enjoy it. So with Without further ado, three strategies to help you improve reading comprehension on the GRE. Well, let's look at reading comprehension first. So we're going to start with reading comprehension, then turn our attention to the sentence completions. And I have a few strategies for you to help you with reading comprehension. And the first thing, my best advice to you right now, right out of the gate, is to increase the amount that you are reading between now and test day. So strategy number one, read, read, and read some more. You want to start by reading real former GRE passages. And the best source of those passages is the official guide to the GRE. You see it pictured here in the lower right of your screen. If you don't already have that book, it's essential that you practice from that book for both verbal and quant, by the way, as you're preparing for the GRE. But you want to start with real former GRE passages because those are the types of passages you will see on test day and you want to get familiar with them. And so you want to definitely read those, read a bunch of them, practice those questions, but you also want to increase the amount that you're reading by at least 15 minutes per day, every day between now and test day, of other material that would be labeled, quote, hard. In other words, the type of content, the type of reading material that the GRE takes its reading comprehension passages from. Now, two things to say about this. First, why 15 extra minutes per day? And the reason is because there are a lot of studies that show that 15 minutes is sort of the magic threshold, the magic number where uh, proficiency, reading proficiency, reading skill is accelerated. Now, most people, sadly, they did a study kind of looking at how much um, you know, high school age kids and middle school age kids in the United States specifically, but how much they read. And most do not read for 15 minutes a day. In fact, most read for less than five minutes per day. But they find that if students can get their reading up to at least 15 minutes per day, that's where they see huge gains. That's where the proficiency is accelerated. And even if you currently read, I want you to increase it by 15 minutes per day. I have a, 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 I did an interview on my podcast, and I'll mention my podcast again in a moment when we talk about sentence completion, because there's an episode that I'm going to want you to listen to. But I interviewed a gentleman uh, who took the GMAT, so I know you guys are preparing for the GRE, but he prepared for the GMAT, and he increased his score significantly. And I kind of interviewed him about that and asked him why and kind of like what he did and what worked and what didn't work. And one of the things he said that really, really helped him, especially on the verb verbal section of the GMAT, but again, the GMAT has reading comprehension that's very similar to the reading comprehension you'll see on the GRE. He said, one thing that I started to do was first thing in the morning, as soon as I woke up, I read the New York Times science section for 15 minutes every day between the time he started studying for the GMAT and the time he took the GMAT. 15 minutes per day, and in his case, he, he read the New York Times science section. 
So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about reading something quote unquote hard. The GRE pulls its passages from a wide range of topic areas, the sciences, the social sciences, political types of things, increasingly business. So as the GRE is now used for admission to business school as well, you'll see more and more business types of passages. So maybe you read the Wall Street Journal. Here you see I have listed National Geographic magazine, foreign affairs magazines, the types of things that Maybe about topics you're not very familiar with. And that's the other thing I would say is read stuff that you're not already familiar with because that's part of what makes GRE reading comprehension challenging, right? It's easy to read something that you already know a lot about. It's harder if you get a passage that's about archaeology or like black holes or something about astronomy that you have never, like you don't know anything about that. It's using a bunch of words that you're not familiar with because it uses jargon related to archaeology or something like that. Or maybe you're not a big business person and they're talking about supply curves and demand and all of these topics around business that you're not very familiar with. Now, the good news is, and let me say this, and I always tell my students this as well, you don't want to answer the questions on reading comprehension based on pre-existing knowledge. So I don't want you to read this stuff to try to build up a knowledge base. You are not going to answer questions on test day based on your pre-existing knowledge. You're answering questions based on information given in the passage itself, but that requires comprehension and understanding and learning what you're reading about a topic that you may be not familiar with. And that's why it's important to seek out some periodicals or journals or texts that are in areas that you're not very familiar with. So I hope that makes sense. Read, 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 increase by 15 minutes per day. Here's another website, another resource for you that, uh, that I find enjoyable, my, my students have found helpful. It's called readtheory.org. Uh, they just have a bunch of passages that, uh, that you can practice reading from different types of topics, and they have some questions about those passages. And what's cool about this is, as you get more right answers in answering the questions, the passages get increasingly difficult. So when you first go to the website and you read the first passage, it will be a very easy passage. And for some of you, that's actually a good thing because maybe your reading comprehension level isn't very high. In fact, the first few passages may be at an elementary school level. And then you answer the questions and you get them right. And then the passages get increasingly difficult. And eventually, you can get to where you're reading passages that are college level or even, uh, excuse me, even graduate level in difficulty. And I will say this, you know, not all, it's not GRE specific passages or even GRE specific questions. So I'm not recommending this because I think that it's going to be, you know, incredible practice for the actual questions you'll see on the GRE, but they're still somewhat relevant in terms of like main idea and understanding the author's attitude and tone and the types of things that you will see on the GRE. But it's just another good source of passages to help you improve your reading proficiency. And Here's a final tip on this before we go to the next strategy is regardless of what you are reading, when you get done reading it, whether it's an article from the New York Times or one of the passages in Read Theory, I want you to ask yourself in your own words, what was the main idea of this passage? What was the author's main point? Because at the end of the day, that's the main thing you want to be able to answer in your own words before you start answering questions which leads me to strategy number two, read for big picture. Most questions on reading comprehension on the GRE are big picture types of questions. Sometimes they are flat out, what is the author's main point? Or what is the main idea of this passage? Or what type of, like, where might this passage have come from? Like a business textbook or, you know, they ask the question sometimes in weird ways, but they're still essentially asking, what is the main idea? And so you want to be able to answer that and frame that in your own words before worrying about the questions themselves. Because we can always go back to the passage for specific detailed questions. We want to get our mind around main idea questions first. And so one of the very first things you want to do when you're reading a passage is try to identify 
the thesis sentence. Passages on the GRE tend to be fairly short. They're shorter than they are on, say, the GMAT, which is good news for you taking the GRE. And oftentimes, there is going to be one sentence that if you can find it, right, the, the thesis sentence is the sentence that you should be able to point to and underline that itself summarizes the passage. It is the main idea. It is what the passage is about. And so one thing you want to do when you're practicing for the GRE, when you're preparing, and even when you're just reading on your own, is to ask yourself, what is the thesis sentence? Could I underline, could I point to one sentence that is the main idea? And here's a passage taken straight from the ETS or the, the GRE's kind of main public website. So this is a public domain passage. And it's an example of a real kind of former GRE passage. And I'm actually going to read it out loud just because sitting in silence for two minutes doesn't make for a good webinar. <laughs> but you guys can kind of come back to it if you get lost and, and feel like you need to revisit it. But I'm going to read it out loud. And I want you to think, what is the thesis sentence of this passage? Which sentence represents the main idea of this passage? So you can go ahead and type it in the questions area or the chat area if you determine what you think it is, uh, and then we'll talk about it. But the passage goes as follows. Reviving the practice of using elements of popular music in classical composition, an approach that had been in hibernation in the United States during the 1960s, composer Philip Glass embraced the ethos of popular music in his compositions. Glass based two symphonies on music by rock musicians David Bowie and Brian Eno, but the symphony's sound is distinctly his, uh, distinctively his. Popular elements do not appear out of place in Glass's classical music, which from its early days had shared certain harmonies and rhythms with rock music. Yet this use of popular elements has not made Glass a composer of popular music. His music is not a version of popular music packaged to attract classical listeners. Instead, it is high art for listeners steeped in rock rather than the classics. All right, so there is the passage. What is the thesis sentence? What's the main idea? What's the main idea of this passage? If you were to try to summarize it in your own words, what is it about? It's about this guy, Philip Glass, right? This composer, Philip Glass. Right. And one of the things I, I kind of talk about in my course and talking about main ideas, sometimes sometimes there are answer choices that are too narrow. Um, they're, they're too specific. Like this passage is about, um, you know, um, David Bowie or or incorporating rock music from David Bowie and Brian Eno. Mm, no, that's like that's talked about, but that's a little bit too narrow. Right. A little bit too specific. Uh, you can also have answer choices that would be too broad. This. This passage is about classical music. Mm, yeah, okay. I mean, it is about classical music. It's about Philip Glass, this composer, this classical composer. But that would be a little bit too broad. But what's, what's it really about? Well, the thesis sentence, I would say, is the very first sentence. And oftentimes that is the case. That if you were to summarize what this passage is about... Uh, and even the first part of it is unnecessary. Really, it can be summarized after the comma. Composer Philip Glass embraced the ethos of popular music in his compositions by using elements, so the very first part, right, by using elements of popular music in his classical compositions. That's it. That's the thesis. And then the rest of the passage fleshes that out a little bit, provides more information. Right. For example, here's how he did that. Here's how he has incorporated elements of popular music. He brought in some popular sounds from David Bowie and Brian Eno. But, right, and then it kind of pivots. Even though he has brought this in, he's not a popular rock musician. He is still a classical artist. His music is still, last sentence after the colon, or a semicolon, high, quote, high art, meaning like, for the classics, classical art, classical high art for listeners steeped in rock, right? So he hasn't become a popular musician. He is still focused on his classical music, but he has incorporated some popular elements into his music. That's the main idea. And that's the thesis. And so it's important that we read for big picture because it sets us up to be able to answer the big 
picture questions, right? So we want to identify the thesis sentence. And the second part of the strategy is we want to ignore specific details on the initial reading. This is one of the things I hear from students where English is not their native language is that they get lost in the details. They get lost in the big words, especially the words they might not know or the jargon. And so jargon is a word fancy that basically means, you know, the words about a certain topic, right? All industries have their own jargon. Here they're using words and jargon related to music, popular music, things like composition and classics and symphonies and all of these harmonies and rhythms. And, and those are the types of things that students can get lost in, especially if English isn't your first language. And yet they are not essential to your big picture understanding. They distract you from the big picture understanding that you need to be able to answer most of the questions you will encounter. So you need to learn to read for big picture, identify the thesis and get a big picture understanding and ignore the specific details and let me prove it to you, let me show you. Watch what happens if I literally kind of block out and blacken out all of the non-essential information, all of the distractor details. So you see it on your screen where I have literally blocked out non-essential words. And I'm gonna read the passage again with all of that text missing and show you that you still can understand big picture. In fact, what I have left are the essential elements of the passage, the main idea understanding elements of the passage, right? If I had just read this to you, I want you to ask yourself, would you understand what the passage is saying? If it only said this, composer Philip Glass, in, and I should have actually deleted born in 1937. That's also non-essential information. We don't care when he was born. We can go back and find that if the question asks about it. But that's modifying information, non-essential information. Composer Philip Glass embraced the ethos of popular music in his compositions. Now, the popular elements do not appear out of place in Glass's classical music. Yet, this use of popular elements has not made Glass a composer of popular music his is still high art for listeners steeped in rock rather than the classics. That still makes sense. In fact, it might make more sense to you once I have literally filtered out all of that non-essential information. I call this the bracketing technique, and it's really more of a filtering thing. It's, it's this idea of saying, okay, I'm going to kind of mentally block out the stuff that is distracting me from big picture understanding. And that's a skill that you can develop and it will speed up your reading comprehension. If one of the issues you are having trouble with is speed, meaning it takes you too long to read the passages, it may be because you are focused too much or getting lost in the details. I always remind my students that the GRE is an open book test. When you get to the reading comprehension, uh, reading comprehension passage and the questions, if you are asked about a specific detail, the passage is right there for you. It never goes away. It doesn't disappear. You can always go back and find the necessary information, but you can ignore it on the initial read through. I hope this makes sense and I hope this is liberating for some of you who are struggling with re reading comprehension, just read for big picture. All right. So you want to identify the thesis sentence. You want to ignore some of the specific details on the initial reading because you can go back to that if necessary. And instead you want to focus on these elements of kind of big picture. Because if you take a look at the types of questions that are asked about reading comprehension passages, most of them are big picture questions. What is the author's main idea or main point? What is the purpose of the passage? What does the author think about such and such? That's like an attitude or a tone question, a feeling question. Questions about the structure, the logical flow. What could you infer? Inference questions are big picture understanding questions, right? All of those questions you can answer if you understand big picture. Every once in a while you get a specific detail question. In line 19, the author says such and such in order to 
blah, 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 right? Even that's a little bit big picture. Like in the grand scheme of things, why does the author mention that specific detail? But when they do ask you those questions, you can go back and find the answer. Instead, main idea. We just found the main idea by identifying the thesis sentence. Attitude or tone. Uh, is the author in support of an idea or against an idea, right? Big picture. You should be able to, you should be able to figure that out when you read the passage. You know, I like to think about attitude and tone on a spectrum from negative to positive. A lot of times the answer choices are also arranged that way. The author likes it, doesn't like it, is in favor of it, is not in favor of it, right? So if you can understand big picture, the general idea or attitude the author has, you can answer those types of questions. What's the author's main purpose? And then structure, how does the passage flow. So those are some things that you want to focus on with reading comprehension. And here's another shortcut for you. Uh, and, and I have another cool strategy for you that I'll transition to here in a moment. But when thinking about reading for the big picture, I mentioned that a lot of times reading comprehension passages on the GRE are fairly short. But every once in a while, you will see longer passages that might be two or even three paragraphs long. And if you struggle with those because, again, your reading speed is not very fast or, again, you're getting lost in the details and it's taking you too long, the beautiful thing about the way people tend to write is, you know, they tend to follow the texts on the reading comprehension passages on the GRE are usually professional texts, right? They're taken from professional sources. And how do people write? professionally. Well, usually there's a thesis sentence and then information supporting that thesis and then some sort of a conclusion and then a transition, maybe another kind of mini thesis sentence in the next paragraph, some more supporting information and then a conclusion, right? And so if we're going to ignore a lot of the details anyway, it's amazing how much you can understand if you just read the first and last sentences of each paragraph. So that may sound totally weird to you. Like, are you serious? I'm supposed to literally not read every word? Well, if it's taking you too long to read every word and your goal is to get right answers, skip some of the middle stuff. Just try reading the first and last sentences and see how it goes. And so this is something for you to experiment with, practice with a little bit. But I know I've had a lot of my students who I've recommended this to come back to me and say that they have found it incredibly helpful, that it seems weird in the beginning, that it seems a little bit unnatural, like they feel like they're missing something. But again, think back to the passage when I blocked out all of the unnecessary words, I could still understand what the passage was about. It's amazing how often you can understand what the passage is about with just the first and last sentences. All right, here's strategy number three. And this is what I call the first word cheat code. So here's a really cool strategy for you to help you get right answers if you're struggling with reading comprehension. A lot of times questions will essentially be a complete the sentence kind of setup. Right? So you see a sample question here about the passage we just read that reads, the primary purpose of this passage is to, like dot, 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 right? And the answer choice is essentially complete that sentence. So the primary purpose of this passage is to, well, to do what, right? And oftentimes, the first word in the answer choice is all you need to be able to answer the question. So often we get lost in all of the wording and the answer choices, and I am instructing you to narrow your focus on these types of questions where this is the question set up. Just look at the first word. Notice I haven't given you the rest of the answer choice. I haven't given you the rest of the wording. But just based on this passage, which answer choices do you think we could eliminate? Generally, the author's primary purpose on the GRE is going to be one of three things. To simply illuminate, to give you some information, to educate you about something, right? Isn't trying to convince you of anything, doesn't have a strong position. Either way is just trying to illuminate some information. A little bit more in depth is to evaluate, to look at pros and cons and compare and contrast and to go deeper and maybe try to see whether or not a hypothesis is valid. Those are evaluative types of purposes. And then on the other end of the spectrum would be actually trying to advocate for something, taking a strong position. I am in favor of this or I am against this. I am opposed to this and here is why, right? So with that in mind, 
how might we complete this sentence? Which answer choices do not make sense? Is the author trying to compare anything? Yes or no? Or describing something or questioning something, calling something into question, exploring something, extolling. That means to like prop up the virtues of something. So Paolo, you're saying comparing is something that they are not doing. That's right. They're not comparing anything. The author is not comparing. Now, the author is talking about classical music, in this case, incorporating elements of popular music, but the passage is not actually comparing them or comparing and contrasting them or talking about how one is better than the other. Good. So we can eliminate answer choice A for that reason, right? We could also eliminate answer choice C. It is not questioning anything. There's not anything that the author is trying to call into question or doubting anything. The, it's not advocating for anything. It's not extolling anything, which is a big fancy word that basically would mean um, to talk about the virtues or the positive aspects of something. None of that is happening. This is just an illuminative type of passage. The purpose is just to describe in this case, how Philip Glass has incorporated uh, popular music into his classical compositions, you know, without um, imitating them, but with, by maintaining his own voice, basically, right? That's, that's the main idea. We already talked about that. So, yes, it could be describing something. It could be exploring, exploring how Philip Glass incorporates popular music uh, while maintaining his own unique voice, right? So I haven't given you the rest of the answer explanations. That's not the point here. The point here is to help you narrow your focus. And it's, and, and hey, even if you didn't understand like the rest of the uh, the purpose, if you missed that, at the very worst, you have increased your guessing odds to 50%, 50-50. We've gotten rid of A, C, and E, and at worst, you're now choosing between answer choice B and D, and then obviously, hopefully, the rest of the answer, uh, you know, answer choice description would make clear which is the correct answer. Uh, but anyway, I love this. I call it a cheat code because it, you're going to feel like you're cheating now that I've kind of shown this to you. Uh, it's, it's a really cool strategy. So practice it and pay attention to it the next time you're doing a block of practice questions. Uh, and this works really well on attitude or tone questions as well for the same reason I talked about earlier. If you can kind of arrange the answer choices and often the first word is all you need about an attitude or tone kind of on a spectrum from negative to positive, you usually have a pretty good idea. Hey, is, does the author feel negatively about something or positively about something? That can usually help you eliminate at least two or three answer choices right out of the gate. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that. It's a really cool strategy for you. All right. So what do you think? Helpful? I hope so. And a couple of things that I referenced in the video that I'll just remind you here. The first is I referenced a podcast show, an episode where I actually talked about vocabulary. So reading comprehension, we didn't really talk about that. But on the GRE, you also have to do sentence completions. Vocabulary is important. And episode number 12 of the Dominate Test Prep podcast is all about how to improve your vocabulary. So check that out. I'll actually link directly to it in the notes about this uh, about this video below, or you can just go find the Dominate Test Prep podcast wherever you get your podcast stitcher for Android, uh, obviously Apple, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. And uh, so I think you'll enjoy that episode. And of course, if you want to go deeper into reading comprehension, so even more than what we covered here with actual real examples and questions and all the different question types, and obviously all of the sentence completion stuff, not to mention the, the quant side of the GRE, consider one of our comprehensive courses. We have a verbal specific course if you just want to go deeper into the verbal or our full course and also our math course for the GRE. So head over to dominatethegre.com. Check out our courses. I'll look forward to working with you if you decide to move forward and see you on the inside as we continue to empower you to dominate the GRE.